Hi, everybody. So I put together a presentation on um, different views of knowledge and how human beings acquire knowledge that I've come across while reading, you know, widely on this topic from many different sources. So looking at things from within the secular sphere, other religions, different views within Christianity, um, and it seems that there's quite a quite a wide variety of opinions about how knowledge is formed, how um, we can have certainty about knowledge, what that knowledge should be, and things like this. So, um, you know, within the within the Christian world, we're still we're still working with people that, or we still have people today that follow the Platonic or Aristotelian approaches to knowledge. Um, we have the Sola Scriptura. Protestant view. Um, we have people that are still building on the Enlightenment period's understanding of knowledge that was kind of informed by Descartes and, and Kant and others. We have presuppositionalists um, that start with scripture, usually, or you know, it, it could apply to other other religions as well that have their own holy books. Uh, we have um Calvin and Plantinga and others that talk about a census divinitatis as a as a kind of a basis for knowledge. We have tacit knowledge from people like Michael Paul and, and others. Um, th these are just a sample of different ideas of how human knowledge works, and it seems like there's there's a, a high level of of conflict and competition. Uh, between different people on how this is supposed to work, even if sometimes that that competition is not acknowledged. Um, and part of this topic is also the question of how theology, philosophy, and science are supposed to interact with each other. There's many different views on that as well. Now, um, I am um, proposing in this presentation that this problem uh, has a solution and that solution can be found in the views of Emery Lakatos, who's a philosopher of science. And these views have been kind of applied to Christian theology by Nancy Murphy in the book, especially in the book, uh, A Philosophy of the Christian Religion. And Lakatos's idea is the idea of competing research programs. And I'll explain what that means in a second. Now, the topic that I'm, I'm working with in this presentation is, is somewhat difficult to explain, and I've tried for a while to figure out a way to arrange it and make sense of it so that it's it's easy to understand, but it, I, I still have a hard time with it, so I apologize because this presentation is complicated and difficult, and I'm going to do my best to make it make sense, but uh, I might not be able to succeed. Um, and the only way I could figure out how to do it is to do it in chunks of apparently different topics and then bring all those topics together and try to make it make sense after I, after I kind of explain each independent idea kind of separately from the others. So that's that's what I'm hoping to do here. Um, so basically what we have is that humanity has been in this sort of battle between knowledge and certainty on one side and, and pluralism, relativism, and uncertainty on the other. And every time we think we find a pathway to knowledge, over time we realize that it wasn't as certain as we thought we were. But on the other hand, we can't just abandon ourselves to pluralism, to relativism. There, there's kind of something in our in our nature that insists that we need to have some kind of some kind of solid basis for for knowledge, knowledge both about, you know, the nature of reality, the, you know, what is true and false, uh, knowledge about ethics and morality and things like that. So in all these areas, we have this this drive that pushes us to to try to figure things out, uh, and yet somehow every time we 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 do make that effort, we realize how little uh, that we know or how often we are wrong. So we're constantly kind of pulling back and forth between the, these two polarities. Now. When it comes to, um, uh, let me say one more thing here, that um, when, when it comes to knowledge, people often argue for one particular view, and they say that this is the correct way to approach the topic of knowledge. But then different people, like I said before, have different ideas of that, what that one correct view is, or is supposed to be, and yet they all insist that there's only one correct view. Uh, and then, of course, on the other extreme, people, there's people that say, well, it's impossible to know, so it just kind of abandon the effort altogether. Now, approaches to knowledge tend to be uh, either uh, reason-based or 
uh, sensory knowledge or empirical knowledge base. So human beings basically have two ways to, to gain knowledge. We use our, our reason and our senses. And um, historically, we've had pathways to knowledge that were based in philosophy, and this usually meant um, some kind of concept of the forms, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Or more recently, we had um, science-based um, views of knowledge, and, and that, that, we, that essentially meant that it, they were foundationalist in nature, and I'll explain that as well. And in opposite, in, in, in opposition to this, of course, again, is pluralism, relativism. So you have people that that push for philosophy, and then there's there's others that try to deconstruct that pathway, and then you have people that push towards foundationalism, and there's people that try to deconstruct that. And if if we deconstruct both of these pathways, then we kind of end up moving in this direction. But of course, I mean, we do that, people start feel, feeling uneasy because you can't really function in this sort of pluralist, uh, relativist context. We, we need to know at least some things. So people start trying to look for ways to push in the in one of the other directions again. So this is kind of the the dilemma. It seems like humanity has been been in for for a long time, and it, rather than getting better in the twenty first century, we're just as divided on this and just as confused on this as we've ever been. Even though many people are very confident that they figured it out, and there's tons of people that argue for one particular approach, and they think that's the way to go, but everybody else disagrees with them, and there's so many possible approaches to choose from. Now again, uh, the the philosophy forms based, based knowledge. That's kind of the way things were done in the pre modern era. So this is going back to the time of Plato and Aristotle, all the way to the Middle Ages. Uh, the modern era, you have science and foundationalism. This this started with the Enlightenment and it went all the way to to the nineteen mid mid nineteen hundreds, and then you have postmodernism um, that comes all the way up to the present. And here you have kind of a, a leaning towards pluralism and relativism, but all these things still exist today and they're all in competition with each other today. All right, so just to kind of uh, briefly explain the pre-modern concept of knowledge, the pre-modern concept of knowledge had to do with the form. So, so you have ontology and epistemology. So ontology is a claim about the nature of reality. Epistemology is a claim about how knowledge is, is acquired. And these things are kind of circular. They they kind of work off each other. So ontology is this idea that reality is dualistic, that there's another layer to reality where you have this eternal forms that are timeless, unchanging, and so on, that um, kind of control the nature of physical reality or the reality that, that changes over time. And the forms control both the objects in the world you know, it might be a table, a car, or a horse, or whatever, but the forms also control our perception of those objects. And the reason we're able to to understand or to to recognize the fact that these objects exist is because our minds or our immaterial souls are somehow have some kind of link to the eternal forms, and that's that's why we have knowledge of them. Now, the very nature of this approach to knowledge um, provides some kind of confidence because we, you know, what what we're trying to do is gain access to the form, and the minute we gain access to the form, we can have confidence that we know things properly because the form is stable; it exists out there somewhere, and as long as we tap into it, we 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 can have this confidence in knowledge. So, if somebody embraces this approach, then everything else. Um, is is viewed with a high degree of confidence because they the way they view reality here. All right, so now moving on to the the other. Oh, first let me say this this pathway to knowledge or this way of thinking about knowledge was was basically kind of deconstructed by the uh, <clears throat> the Enlightenment project because people essentially lost confidence in the idea of the forms, and then people like Kant came around and Kant said. Um, the way human beings access knowledge is not just by our, our, our reason or just by our senses, but it's a combination of the two. So, so everything we know in the world, we know because we have this sort of two-way um, connection between a, a mental construct that we, we've developed and the, the, the sensory experience of that object. And 
we cannot know something just by the sensory experience of it, and we cannot know something just by the mental construct of it. We have to have both to be able to have knowledge. So if that's the case, and if Pant was correct that both of these things are required for knowledge, then the conclusion follows that that is the, the depth of metaphysics, which is what, what his claim was. And the reason is because since we have no sensory access to metaphysics, by definition, we cannot have knowledge of it since we need both of these inputs to have knowledge. Now, what I'm going to argue later on is that uh, there's some degree to which Kant was right and some degree to which he was wrong, and I'll explain why. But people that still believe in pre-modern um, philosophical uh, you know, approaches today, part of their task is to deconstruct Kant and to explain why he was wrong in, in, in his uh, philosophy and his arguments here. The people that took Kant seriously, on, their other, on the other hand, uh, historically moved from the pre-modern ways of thinking, they moved forward to this, this found, foundationalism approach to, to knowledge. And uh, the way this worked is basically started with, with Descartes and his idea that I think therefore I am. So basically Descartes said, okay, there's a foundation to knowledge that is, is certain, it's indubitable, it cannot be questioned, and that foundation is simply the fact that I exist. Um, it is impossible for me myself not to exist because even questioning my own existence, I would have to exist to be able to question that. So he said, okay, we can have this, this sure foundation of knowledge. And then if we build every layer of knowledge on top of that, then everything, the whole pyramid going up would be very solid and we can have high confidence in it. But what this created was kind of a metaphor. It wasn't so much an actual thing that was accomplished here, but it, it pro produced a metaphor for how knowledge should work. Now, what happened in, in, in practical life is that people realized, yes, you could have confidence that you exist, but it's very hard to have confidence on things after that because um, the, the next layer of knowledge is not as easy to demonstrate as, as the fact that I myself exist. So it kind of opened up the, the, the this sort of situation where solipsism became very difficult to explain Ex, uh, to escape rationally because while I can be confident that I exist, everything else could be just a figment of my imagination. So the way people generally approach this is to say, look, we need to escape the solipsism here. So we, we, we're going to have this other layer. And this layer is basically known as the properly basic beliefs. And people said, well, we're just going to take this for granted. So I know that I exist but I don't know anything else after that, but I'm just gonna take for granted the fact that other people exist, other minds, they're out there. So it's not just my mind producing all these illusions. Other minds do exist and the world around us does exist. And there's a few other components that are necessary, but these became properly basic beliefs. It became like a layer here that people just say, look, we're gonna take this for granted because we don't have a way to, to demonstrate it. But then once we've established this, everything else we're gonna build through scientific knowledge. So in other words, any other claim we have, we're gonna conduct research, we're gonna do experiments and we're gonna demonstrate it scientifically, you know, hopefully a large sample size, hopefully uh, double blind experiments and all this stuff. And then our knowledge structure can be very certain. We can be very confident in what we know. There's, there's a bunch of stuff we won't be able to prove, at least not immediately. But at least the stuff that we can prove, we can be very confident in, and everything else, you know, it doesn't matter. We're just not, we're not sure about anything else, but we are sure about the things that we know. So this is kind of an idea that emerged from the Enlightenment. And the idea came to be known as foundationalism. And it came to be a, a different way of uh, arriving at confidence in, in our, our knowledge base. Now, when you get further into the 1900s, people start moving away from this foundationalist paradigm. The very metaphor of foundationalism started to become, to be abandoned. So you have people like Quine, who was another philosopher of science, and he proposed the, the metaphor of a web of beliefs. So in other words, you're not so concerned about there being some kind of solid foundation that you're building knowledge on layer upon layer. But the reason you can have relative confidence in your knowledge structure is because you have this interconnected web. So you have a belief here, but it's not a, a static or independent belief. This, this particular belief 
is connected to a, a series of other beliefs that are also connected to a series of other ideas or beliefs and taken together they produce uh, some level of confidence because you know they they're they're all interacting together in a coherent way now let's say you come to a point where uh, you realize that some idea that you hold presently is actually incorrect. It doesn't line up with the data anymore and you need to change it. It's not a problem because you have all these other ideas, all these other components of knowledge around it. And you, when you change this, this one idea, then the others kind of help you to, to, to replace it and to come up with the, you know, to fix, to fix up the problem and, and go on with your knowledge building uh, enterprise. So that was Quine's proposal here. So then Kuhn, uh, Kuhn comes, Thomas Kuhn comes along and he says, well, Quine is actually correct on a general basis. So usually as science progresses, we find different things here and there that we need to, to correct and we correct them and the other knowledge components around it help us to, to, to replace it. But over time, you know, after, after some extended period of time, science actually gets to a point where it has to do this complete paradigm shifts. So you're not just replacing singular components of the web, you're replacing entire sections of the web at once because you start to realize that that, that whole um, combination of ideas doesn't work as a whole. So you have this paradigm shifts and you gotta, you gotta switch them out completely and come up with something different. And Kuhn said that this paradigm shifts um, the, the paradigms themselves are incommensurable. So basically people that function within this one paradigm, um, they have to switch out completely and change, completely change the way they think about it because uh, the, the, the paradigms are, don't really have a way to, to make sense alongside each other. You can't really make sense of them alongside each other. And basically knowledge over time it has this kind of steady, steady progress. And then you have a paradigm shift and everything changes. And then you kind of start over, but but there's still some, some level of progress, but things are very different now than they were before. And he gave different examples of this. But the problem with Kuhn's proposal is that, again, you have this situation where you have this polarities of certainty and knowledge versus relativism and, and pluralism and uncertainty. And for a lot of people, it seemed that we are moving from the, the certainty of foundationalism back towards the uncertainty of pluralism by this paradigm shift. Because how do you know that you know whatever paradigm you're working with right now and you have confidence in is not going to be changed you know, 20, 50, 100 years from now? Um, so that became kind of a problem because the, there was this uneasiness again, whereas before people thought that they were building, building on a solid foundation. Now again, they're not, you know, there's uncertainty in the process. So then comes uh, Lakatos and he says, no, uh, sure, there, there is such a thing as Kuhn is saying, there is such a thing as paradigm shifts, but they don't have to be incommensurable. Um, and he proposed instead that we think of them as competing research programs. So you could have multiple paradigms working side by side and um, you, know, you don't have to always replace the old paradigm with a new paradigm. So the way he envisioned the, the, the knowledge process is that you could have multiple paradigms at the same time. Some paradigms seem to be progressive. In other words, they, as more and more data emerges, the, the paradigms develop more fully and, and you, you, they fit with the data and they seem to work. Other paradigms seem, seem to be degenerating or they're regressing. In other words, they, they don't fit the new data as well. But you cannot just abandon them altogether because you don't know that, you know, 20, 50, 100 years from now, it's not going to change. So maybe the paradigms that seem progressive today are going to start regressing, while those that are degenerating today are going to have a turnaround and start working again. So you got to keep them uh, kind of in this parallel side-by-side -side, uh, context um, and give them time to develop just, just to be sure. But eventually you realize that so much data has been produced that that you know might contradict certain paradigms that you just get to a point where you just discard them altogether. So some paradigms have degenerated completely and you discard them, while others can continue to 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 build side by side. And you kind of you gotta the one thing you gotta do is you gotta be honest where the paradigm is at. Is it progressing? Is it uh, degenerating? Um, 
and eventually you gotta decide whether to hold on to it or you're gonna switch and, and move and do something else. So this is kind of Lakatos's vision, and there's additional components to this to this uh, process that that the philosophy of science has gone through. But we're gonna focus on this here because I think this this approach is is usable for what we're trying to do. So uh, Lakatos gave this idea of of competing research programs. Each paradigm is its own research program, and and it provided a way forward where you could work on multiple things at the same time. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and just uh, talk about various things that have to do with the way science works. So usually with science, uh, if you're doing, if you're studying any issue and you start to to conduct experiments or do research to do the scientific work, you start to to gather evidence, and over time, as you gather more and more evidence, uh, I, uh, you know, hypotheses that maybe seemed relatively uncertain. I mean, you know, sure, you were working with a hypothesis, but you were you're not really sure if it's correct or not. You're, you know, it's 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 working for you now, but you're still in the beginning stages, so you don't really know. Uh, but as you keep collecting evidence, you get to a stage where you have relatively good confidence in that hypothesis. You know, it seems to do pretty well. You're still not, you know highly confident that it's going to prove correct in the long run, but at least you can have some level of confidence in it. And then as you continue to progress in your research, there comes a time when the, the evidence and the data you've collected is so strong that you could say, hey, we're very, we're very confident that this particular idea was correct. So science tends to build up its confidence over time like this. Uh, this is just something to keep in mind as, as we move forward. Okay, now the nature of scientific knowledge is that, like I said, you have certain areas that you could have a high degree of confidence in. And then as you move our from the inner from the inner circle here, that's green, you get to this lesser confidence area where where you're still not fully sure if something's gonna prove correct or not. But then you get to an area where you, you don't really know much about at all. So either you haven't studied that area at all or you're in the beginning stages of studying. Now think about it this way, you know, if you think of the universe, uh, we, uh, by, by some measurements, were able to, to uh, observe using our best instruments only maybe about 10% of the actual universe. So whatever we think the universe is in size, we can only observe about 10% of it. So. The rest, of the, the rest of the 90% of the universe will be in this red area here because we have no access to it. We have no way to observe it or to, to know what's there. So as science progresses, hopefully the red area becomes smaller and smaller and the green and yellow areas continue to increase. But it's possible that we might never be able to access some of the, the knowledge we need to access um, in the universe. Because for example, as the universe expands, we might never be able to reach the outer edges of it to to learn things about it. You know, that's just that's just one one example, but this could be applied to any area of knowledge. So we have this the stages, the the high confidence, lesser confidence, and the unknown areas in science. But then there's another layer, which is metaphysics, which is basically some kind of immaterial realm of reality, and it might not even exist. So again, even if somebody says, how do you know there's such a thing as metaphysics out there? Maybe there's nothing. Yeah, that's just a hypothesis about the nature of metaphysics. It, your hypothesis is that it doesn't exist. We don't know what's out there. We don't have a pathway to know to know it scientifically because science cannot access that by, by the very definition of how science works. So there's all these layers of knowledge. Some we can access, some we cannot through scientific means. All right, so now, Taking the same idea and looking at it with a, with a different from a different illustration, metaphysics is kind of like if you look at this tree. Um, when you look at the tree, you can see the trunk and the branches and the leaves and everything else, but underneath the ground you have the the roots and you cannot see the the root system underneath. Uh, but obviously, there's something down there that has an impact of what what you can actually observe um, on the surface. So while you cannot see what's underground, you know that something's there to make what's above the ground uh, able to, you know, for the tree to, able to be able to withstand the winds and all that and to be able to get nutrients and so on. So metaphysics is like this. If it exists, is the kind of thing that 
likely has some kind of impact on reality somehow, even though we cannot access it. Okay, so coming back now to Kant's claim that because of the nature of human knowledge, where, where, which is this interaction of the of the mental construct and the sensory input, because of that, we we have no way to access the metaphysics. So he said, you know, this this marks the death of metaphysics very much because there's no way to to gain metaphysical knowledge. So what I would say is that he was right in one sense, in that in in the sense that we cannot be certain as to what is uh, kind of on the other side of the curtain or below the surface, underneath the ground, so to speak, with my, my little tree illustration there. But what we can do is to postulate possibilities. So we could say, okay, here's one possible metaphysical paradigm that could exist. Here's another paradigm that could exist. Here's another. We can think about different possibilities that might be out there. And then we can think about the implications such metaphysical paradigms might have on the real world. So even though we cannot access it directly and, and figure out by, by rational processes, figure out exactly what's back there or what's behind the curtain, so to speak, we can still guess at it, postulate at it, and then work backwards and, and think about the implications. So what exactly are the possible metaphysical uh, scenarios? So we have naturalism, which says pretty much there is no metaphysics. That's an option. Maybe, maybe there just isn't anything outside of the material world. So we can put that out as a possible hypothesis. Another option is uh, what I call theistic monism. So basically, the the world is exactly the way the, the naturalist imagines it, but there's also a God that exists. So you have God and the natural material world and nothing else. So that's one option. Another option is, is some kind of form of dualism. And, and there's three main forms of dualism. You have Platonic dualism, which views reality as two separate layers. You have our Aristotelian dualism, which views components of reality as having two layers inside of them. So here's an object, part of it is material, part of it is immaterial. So it's kind of a different picture of dualism. Then you have Cartesian dualism that is kind of similar to theistic monism, actually. It only thinks, it only considers dualism when it comes to the mind. So basically, our consciousness, our self awareness, that kind of stuff. Uh, that's an immaterial thing. So basically like a soul, um, but everything else is material. So, you know, essentially Cartesian dualism is 90% the same as the theistic monism, but then it's like, at least when it comes to the humans, the human mind, it, it could uh, kind of join sides with one of these other dualistic options. Now, there are some metaphysical possibilities for example, I've already mentioned solipsism, which is the idea that I'm the only one that exists. Everything else is 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 everything else in the world is just my own mental construct. That's one one metaphysical paradigm. Another one is idealism, which is the idea that everything in the world is not real; it's just itself a mental construct. Um, so yes, there are multiple minds in the world. But there's a, a higher, like maybe God, God provides this mental construct and we all interact with each other as if there's an actual world out there when, when the whole world is just God's imagination and we're little minds inside this bigger mind type of thing. So, so those are metaphysical possibilities, but we really don't have a way to consider them in the context I'm, I'm, I'm proposing here because these options don't really interact with the real world. In other words, if I embrace solipsism, I cannot say anything about the, the, the world at large. I cannot interact with the scientific. Uh, <clears throat> uh, basically, science has nothing to do with these things because there's no way to make predictions, starting from solipsism and then saying what exactly, how exactly that's going to impact science and conduct experiment and research based on that paradigm. So the same with idealism. It, it's not because it doesn't take the world as real and science treats the world as real, it doesn't really have a way to interact with the world, at least not a way that's substantially different than any of these other options. So there are metaphysical paradigms that, that are not gonna work with what I'm proposing here, but there are paradigms that possibly can, can work with, with what I'm trying to do. Okay, so now we're switching gears again. 
And I want to talk a little bit about methodological naturalism in science. <clears throat> so modern science has this, this core principle. You could say it's the, the, the very heart, the philosophical heart or center of the way modern science works. And this philosophical center is methodological naturalism. And what this is, is not an ontological claim. In other words, it's not a claim that naturalism as a, as a metaphysical claim is correct. All it's saying is that when somebody does science, they should do science as if the naturalist perspective was correct. So they should think of the world as just a sequence of cause and effect reactions that have, have no interaction with anything supernatural, God, metaphysics, anything like that. They should just treat the world as completely material and natural and do their science that way in their methodologies and the way they approach it, regardless of what they actually believe about reality. And this, this is a norm of modern science and all, all, all science um, kind of is expected to be done from that perspective. Now, <clears throat> I've come across multiple thinkers within the more conservative branches of Christianity that actually oppose this idea of methodological naturalism. So here's some examples. We have two books here. One is a history and critical methodological naturalism here. Another one is naturalism and its alternatives in scientific methodologies. These people are proposing alternatives or, or critiquing methodological naturalism. And then this book by J.P. Moreland and William Lane Craig covers a lot of other topics, but there's a section on methodological naturalism in there, and they actually critique it to some limited degree as well. But I believe that there's a fundamental misunderstanding on the part of the people that critique methodological naturalism. And that misunderstanding is that methodological naturalism is not the kind of thing that you could critique philosophically. The only way to oppose methodological naturalism is to do something in the real world. And what you need to do is you need to articulate a different methodology. So if you don't like methodological naturalism, come up with a whole different methodology and then gain consensus about this methodology. So whatever your methodology is, see if you could get people from different denominations, people from different religions, maybe even secular people, but that might be harder or atheists, whatever. But at least people from different points of view, see if you will get them to come together around this new methodology you're proposing and then actually do science. So go out there, do research, do stuff and apply your methodology in the real world. Have a scientific community where you could publish your journals and you could gather your information and, and, and uh, compare the research of one person with another person in different parts of the world and within different contexts and do what normal scientists are doing and do this over an extended period of time, maybe 50 years, 100 years, and demonstrate to the world that your methodology is just as effective as the methodology of normal science. That's the only way to fight against methodological naturalism. It doesn't help anybody that this person wrote this book or this other book here and published it. That's not gonna change anybody's mind. The only way to undo methodological naturalism is to actually demonstrate that it works in the real world. And you, you need to show that it's either just as good as regular science or that it's better. And if over decades you demonstrate that, then people will, will consider it. But until that, you know, providing philosophical treatises and arguments against methodological naturalism is not gonna change anything, right? So what I'm saying is that in the meantime, until somebody until and unless somebody can do such a demonstration, we're, we're stuck working with methodological naturalism. And what I'm gonna be saying for the rest of this presentation is gonna assume that that is the only option we have at this point in time and we need to work with it. All right, so moving on. <clears throat> now, again, a kind of a, a shift in direction here. I wanna talk a little bit about the, the way the scientific community works. So. The scientific community is, is the sort of body of scientists and, and thinkers and philosophers and so on that are kind of gatekeepers over the scientific process. And the way things work here is that when scientists go out into science, 
they collect the results and they publish them in peer-reviewed scientific journals. And these journals become public record that's universally accessible, even if it, it's behind a paywall, but at least people from all over the world that are researching different topics can tap into it and figure out what has already been demonstrated, evaluate the research, you know, check to see if they could replicate it, things like that. And it becomes a depository of scientific knowledge. But these journals only publish certain things and they tend to publish things that follow the accepted scientific norms, including methodological naturalism. So if somebody comes in and tries to do scientific research without using methodological naturalism or, or who is trying to put in metaphysical arguments and religious based arguments, they're not going to publish them. They're going to keep them out of scientific journals. And if, if it's outside the scientific journals, it's not going to build our existing body of knowledge. Once these things have been published, then they, they over time, they, they get written into the educational textbooks. And this has to do with public school textbooks. It has to do with the university textbooks. Um, so basically, when people go to school and they learn this stuff, whether they just learn it for like general knowledge or whether they learn it because they're actually trying to become scientists, it becomes part of their conceptual reality. So they start to view the world through the lens of this body of scientific knowledge that has been kind of condensed and synthesized and placed into their educational, um, you know, materials. Uh, besides this, this scientific body of knowledge um, gets shared with the media. So that the movies we watch, the things we see on TV, in the news are impacted by our assumptions about reality that are, are gathered from, from the scientific research. It affects governments. In other words, governments make decisions about different things and they consult actual scientists who study those things. For example, we had the pandemic and we had scientists running the pandemic response because those were the experts that knew and had the, had the body of knowledge to, to um, make decisions about what should be done. So all these elements are there. There's this, there's this community of people that work together to, to collect knowledge, and to, to make it usable and apply to different circumstances. And this is a very um, tightly protected context. So people cannot just throw in there any random stuff and expect it to be taken seriously and expect it to be passed on to the public as if it's scientific fact. Now, because of the evolution debates, so over the past hundred years or so, there's been tons of debates between evolutionists and creationists and intelligent design proponents and different kinds of approaches to evolution, like um, what is it, evolutionary creationists and all these different things. Um, the people within the scientific community have been especially on the edge, uh, given that people promoting creationism try to bypass the scientific process and go to the courts and they try to put sort of what they call pseudoscientific information into, into public school textbooks or, or, or find a way to get, their, to get their stuff into the public context. And there's been court cases and battles. So the scientific community has been very much on the edge about what comes in and out and what is allowed to, to, to exist within the scientific context. I have a picture of a jail cell here. It's been very well locked down for several decades because of this debates that have been happening. Uh, but the reality is if something is not published in scientific journals, it just doesn't exist. So you have, you have creationists that have developed their own scientific communities where they do their own creationist research, but whatever research they do is not published in the journal um, scientific research, um, the, the publicly accessible, public acceptable scientific journals. And because of that, they're, whatever they've done, nobody really knows. It hasn't really impacted the public because if it's not in, in this official journals, it more or less doesn't exist. So um, whatever happens, if we wanted to, to have an impact on society, it needs to find its way into scientific journals. And what I'm proposing is that the 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 level of lockdown and the level of control that the scientific community has had over this process needs to be just slightly opened up uh, in order to to make room for a, a little bit more stuff. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. 
Okay, so the problem that we have is that even though there's there's a large section of people, uh, even or especially among among the the scientific world, that basically have adopted naturalism, they're atheists, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in supernatural or anything like that. They're naturalists. Um, just because that's where they are personally, that's that's their philosophy, that's their belief system, doesn't mean it's been proven. It doesn't mean that we can have a high degree of confidence that that is what in fact is the, the correct stuff, even though a lot of them believe this. A lot of atheists today think that their perspective of reality is more or less correct. In, in, but the truth is that they, they have no real basis for knowing that the, there's no way to demonstrate that that's correct. And some of these other paradigms that I mentioned, whether it's different forms of dualism, whether it's uh, theistic monism, and so on, some of these other paradigms are actually still in play. Even if we say because we spent the past two centuries doing science from within the kind of a naturalistic paradigm, this one might be the primary model today or the primary hypothesis is the preferred hypothesis. Some of these other options are still in play. They have not been disproven. They have not been discarded completely. They, there's, there's, a, there's still a decent possibility that they could actually be correct. And if that's the case, it doesn't make sense that all of our science only work within a within a naturalistic paradigm when some of these other options could also could also be correct in the end. And we have no way to prove it, we have no way to know, because all this stuff is within the metaphysical sphere that we have no way to demonstrate or access uh, in a in a scientific way. So what do we do with this? Well, we need to take each one of these metaphysical paradigms and think through the implications. What exactly are the implications of, um, you know, a dualist metaphysic? What are, what are the implications of a um, theistic monism um, paradigm? And think through it that way. So here's an example of how this this might might work. It, let's let's say we take the, the naturalistic paradigm. <clears throat> If we if we have this this chart here or this uh, this graph and we say okay, we begin at the Big Bang and we end at the present, right? So th this is the entire history of the universe from the Big Bang to the present. The naturalistic paradigm assumes that there's this this uninterrupted sequence of cause and effect events, kind of like a domino chain, where you know the Big Bang happened here and and because of that some other thing happened and because of that some other thing happened and then one thing after another, an endless sequence of events that brings us to the present and to the to the version of reality that we know today. The universe is the way it is, the planet is the way it is, human beings are here the way they are, and so on. So whatever, however this happened, this is just a natural sequence, a material sequence of events, kind of like a domino effect. But if we switch paradigms and we say, uh, let's let's think about the implication of theistic monism. If we have theistic monism, then that's not necessarily the case. We might still have something similar. We might still have a big bang, things unfolding over time. But maybe at some point in time, there was some kind of divine input. Because for whatever reason, things weren't unfolding the way that, that the divinity wanted them to. So maybe things went a certain way for a while. Then God steps in and does something here. Then things continue to unfold through natural processes on their own, then God steps in and does something else there, and then it goes up to the present. So there's kind of a different sequence of events if this is correct. If, however, dualism is correct, you don't have divine evil because you have the second layer of reality. And for in whatever way that second layer of reality could impact the material reality. So it might guide it, it might change the trajectory, it might have some kind of effect on it, right? So whichever of these paradigms happens to be correct, it has implications for how things happen in the in the world. Okay, so now uh, kind of taking this and, and going slightly more complex, there's there's multiple paradigms that, that can work with each one of this. So we have naturalism, and naturalism has this kind of uninterrupted chain of, of natural events, but there's also something called liberal Christianity, and, and it was started by people like Schleimacher, which actually believes it's part of its theological core 
that God exists, but God created through natural processes. So liberal Christians have the exact same paradigm as atheists or naturalists in that they believe things started from the beginning and, and follow this uninterrupted sequence of events by natural processes all the way to the end. And God is somewhere behind the scenes there. But God is the one that intended to create this way, and he chose this natural process as a process of creation. So liberal Christianity and, and naturalism more or less have the same paradigm. Now, one of the reasons this is important is because a lot of times atheists will say, well, I have a lot of scientist friends who are Christians, and they don't have a problem with this or that. But one of the reasons they don't is because their theology actually lines up with that. Their theology uh, a priori tells them what to expect. And, and their, their version of reality is the same more or less as the naturalist version of reality. Okay, so then you have dualists, and I've already said that dualism could be Platonic, it could be Aristotelian. Um, these two perspectives, Plato and Aristotle, could kind of work side by side. They might have different implications in certain respects, but in other respects, the, they might have similar implications. So they might be able to cooperate, uh, you know, in, in their view of reality. Um, and then I also mentioned already that Cartesian dualism, even though it's a form of dualism, it's almost the same as theistic monism for the most part until you get to human beings and consciousness, and then they could switch sides and join forces with these guys. Okay, now, not just this, but you could have multiple religions. So what happens with other religions? Because I've mostly been talking about Christianity, right? These are different perspectives with this, within Christianity. Well, Islam, for example, it's its philosophical structures are Aristotelian. So Islam can actually join with the people working on this dualistic uh, perspective, and they could join forces here and, and, and build together towards that. Other religions might have a, a, a metaphysical paradigm that's kind of like the idealist and the solipsist, which, which doesn't really work because it doesn't really interact with the real world. And unfortunately, there's not much they could do there. Or there might be some world religions that have a perspective that's unique. That's that's not any one of the ones mentioned. So then that just becomes a different hypothesis and we could add it to this list of hypotheses that we can study out. And they're welcome to work on their own model of reality that they believe in. But overall, it's still a very small collection of possibilities. This is not like an endless collections where you have 10,000 different metaphysical paradigms and we have to study each one to see what implication it has. It, it's, you know, it's probably half a dozen perspectives that are in play here. And a lot of times they overlap so they could actually join together and, and work towards the same goals. Like I've, I've showed here with different forms of dualism or different form, forms of monism and so on. So um, <clears throat> Even if we're looking at multiple metaphysical paradigms, we're now working with, with an infinite array of possibilities. But unfortunately, so far, the only two paradigms that have received the full attention have been the naturalistic and by association, the liberal Christian perspective, because they kind of have the same view. So what I'm saying is we need to provide a, an entry point for these other paradigms to test out their ideas in a scientific way. Okay, so again, we're kind of switching gears again. So I've already pointed out that um, scientific knowledge kind of progresses through this through this sort of graph here where you start with relative uncertainty, you reach a level of workable certainty, and then you get to a high level of certainty. But let's apply this now to what will happen, <clears throat> what would happen if either the, the monistic perspectives are correct or the dualistic perspectives are correct, if, if those metaphysical models happen to be the correct ones. Well, what, what can science do if science works with methodological naturalism? Well, all it can do is it can propose a naturalistic hypothesis, it can make predictions, it can do research and collect data, and then check if those predictions were confirmed or not. If they were not confirmed, you, you go back to the beginning, you come up with a new hypothesis. If they were, if the, yes, they were confirmed, then you go back and you do more research and collect more data and you go into the cycle. And the more you go around the cycle of, of research, confirmation, and, and going back and forth, the more your certainty increases on this chart. And after a while, you could get so confident in something because you have a lot of evidence supporting it. But the problem is here that if we have a situation where like, just as an example, I showed that 
maybe the theistic monism paradigm happens to be the correct one. And at some point in the history of the universe, there was an intervention from, from the divinity, like God stepped in and, and did something because the natural way that things unfolded um, wasn't going exactly where he wanted or what, didn't have the capacity to move any further. And he had to step in and, and, and uh, give it a kind of an additional push. Let, let's just hypothetically say that that's, that's the correct paradigm and that's what happened. Uh, methodological naturalism or the scientific process doesn't have a way to deal with that because all it can propose is naturalistic hypothesis. It cannot propose that God stepped into, into history and did something supernaturally. It has to find a natural explanation for something, even though in reality it happened supernaturally. And what it does is it keeps proposing hypotheses. And let's say the first dozen hypotheses that people try don't work after a while, and they have to keep trying something new and something new. But usually what happens is that eventually you come to a hypothesis that seems to work. So you get into this workable uh, workable certainty yellow area here on the chart. And it seems like, okay, we have a hypothesis that's working for us. And it might take decades or even hundreds of years before we realize, hey, this is wrong. It's not working. But let's say the time passes and then we realize, no, this hypothesis doesn't work either. It's it's bad, even though it's we've been using it for a while. What can you do then? You're still not going to consider the supernatural possibility because it's, it doesn't work with methodological naturalism. That's not an option you have. So you have to come up with yet another naturalistic hypothesis. And then even if you run out of ideas and you can't think of anything else, you don't give up and say, oh, they must have been supernatural. You say, oh, uh, we're just going to wait another few hundred years. Maybe finally then we'll gather enough evidence and come up with a better idea. So there's never a time working with methodological naturalism where you could actually uh, arrive at the place where you say, okay, we've exhausted all the possible naturalistic hypothesis. We know that for sure. So therefore it must be supernatural because that's what you would have to do to ever get to the supernatural. But in the real world, in, in real practice, you can never exhaust all the possibilities because you don't know what you don't know. You don't know that a thousand years from now, you won't come up with something different or something better that, that might actually work. So the, the methodological naturalism process ends up keeping you in this sort of false positive situation where you can never really take into account divine intervention, even if it's something that did happen in a hypothetical scenario, as they say. Um, so methodological naturalism is not really compatible with the with either the divine input perspective or the dualistic perspective down here. So there needs to be some kind of workaround, some kind of other way to, to, to deal with the situation if we have no choice but to work with modern science, which, which involves working with methodological naturalism. So what is, what is a way to deal with that? Well, all the metaphysical paradigms that I, have, I had on that left column, uh, meaning that they're, they're legitimate paradigms as opposed to idealism and, and solipsism, all of them, whatever they assume about the metaphysical reality, they all have to interact with the real world at some point. So the, the material world, this metaphysical reality eventually pierces into the material world, just like the root system on that tree eventually comes to the surface and, and uh, develops into the trunk and the rest of the tree, right? So regardless of what your metaphysical model is, at some point it interacts with, with the material world. So the question is, can we take that and, and come up with a naturalistic hypothesis that represents what exactly we think happened when the metaphysical reality interacted with the real world? Because if we can come up with a naturalistic hypothesis, we can stay within the methodological naturalism perspective. So uh, <clears throat> each metaphysical paradigm then can be treated as a competing research program working with Lakatos' uh, metaphor. So we take the um, the naturalistic, we take the, the metaphysical idea and we come up, we convert it to a naturalistic hypothesis. We make testable predictions. We test out those predictions. We conduct our experiments and so on. We collect our data. And if it happens to work, and even if it doesn't, we publish the results, but they have to be published in scientific journals, peer reviewed, the, the same scientific journals that all science is published in, but it needs to be published as a minority perspective. 
So this is a minority hypothesis about the nature of reality. Here's a different metaphysical paradigm. And we could we could have them all working together. So we could have the, the Aristotelian dualist paradigm here and the Platonic dualist paradigm here and the Cartesian dualist, um, yeah, Cartesian dualist paradigm here, the mon, mon, uh, tasting monism paradigm here and so on. Each one of those is um, a minority perspective that gets to publish its own views in, in, in uh, commonly accepted scientific journals, but they're not publishing metaphysical claims. They're publishing the results of actual scientific experiments. Like, hey, we started with this metaphysical idea. We proposed some kind of natural implication of that idea. We did our experiments and we got these results and here, here's, here we are publishing the results. And what I want to point out with this is that for, for much of the past few hundred years of scientific history, people were very scared to allow religious and metaphysical concepts into science for good reason. Because, you know, if somebody says, well, um, I believe that this metaphysical perspective happens to be the correct one, and here's my meta my uh, rationalistic arguments and my metaphysical arguments, whatever, boom, that's science, you got to accept it and so on. Well, it doesn't really work that way. Science doesn't work. You cannot prove things through philosophy in science. And <clears throat> scientists and the scientific community had good reason to be very careful not to allow metaphysical and religious ideas in. But in this situation, we're not allowing metaphysics in. We're allowing the, the results of testing out the implications of those ideas. So whatever danger the scientific community was protecting the world from, which was a legitimate concern, that doesn't apply to this situation. So what we're doing here is we're using the metaphysics to derive uh, real world implications. We're coming up with naturalistic hypotheses. We're, we're coming up with testable predictions. We're testing those predictions and whether they're confirmed or not, we're publishing the results within this particular model um, or this particular, uh, yeah, this particular metaphysical perspective within the same scientific journals. And in the long run, this would actually be a positive for science because people working with different metaphysical perspectives are gonna be looking at things differently than everybody else doing science. People doing science under the normal naturalistic paradigm. They're gonna have different ideas and they're gonna test out different things and it doesn't hurt anybody. In fact, it's actually gonna be a positive contribution to science to say, hey, there's somebody over there that tested out some really off the wall idea that we would never have thought of. And hey, they got some good results. Or even if they didn't get any good results, we could say, hey, at least we know that it'll work. And we could eliminate that as a, as a pathway to, to try out. So science can actually benefit from having these metaphysical paradigms produce their own research and produce their own experiments and produce their own results and publishing those results within the same context that's accessible to everybody so that the knowledge can build up over time and we can have a better sense of what we're dealing with and you know how these paradigms are competing with each other and how what exactly the results are. <clears throat> okay, so now again, I'm shifting directions just for a second because I want to show how this whole thing works with religion now. So we're, we've talked about philosophy and metaphysics. We talked about science and methodological naturalism. And now I want to point out that religion can actually be built on top of this metaphysical paradigm. So let's say we acknowledge the fact that there's multiple metaphysical models that could be true, and we have no way to prove that they're not true. And we allow them to do their work within the scientific context and to publish in legitimate scientific journals. However, they're doing in, in this process, they exist and they're acknowledged as, as real and legitimate possibilities. And now theologians can come and say, okay, I'm going to work with this metaphysical paradigm and I'm going to build my theology on top of that. And somebody else will say, okay, there's three different theological or maybe three different denominations here. They're all working with the Cartesian dualism paradigm. And maybe there's one or two denominations that are working with the Aristotelian dualism paradigm or, or whatever. But theology can then be built on top of these metaphysical models as opposed to having to interact directly with the naturalistic scientific perspective, which has caused a lot of difficulty, a lot of conflict for, for religion over the past 
two, three hundred years or whatever it's been. So um, now, because these paradigms are also viewed as legitimate possibilities, even if they're minor possibilities, like maybe we say that this is 80 percent likely and all these only have like a 10 percent likelihood, but still they're legitimate possibilities. Right. And because of that, there's some level of respectability for theologians to build on um, their own to build their own views on top of that as well. And not just this, but now metaphysics becomes kind of a, a, a bridge between religion and science where the two don't have to interact directly with each other. So scientists don't have to sit there and, and say, oh, there's like a thousand different denominations and I'm going to have to see what this guy believes and what that guy believes and this holy book and that holy book and, um, you know, this text versus that text and all these debates and how am I going to ever figure all that stuff out? I need to focus my attention on, on doing science. Well, they're not going to have to interact with any of that because metaphysics and the different paradigms, the different metaphysical paradigms become a bridge between science and religion. So science, scientists just interact with what happens here. Religionists just interact with what happens between religion and metaphysics, and they don't have to interact directly with each other in that sense. So this is another advantage of taking this multiple model approach. All right, so now... I suggest that this becomes a way forward to this dilemma that we are in, where it seems that everybody is pulling in some direction, but they can never agree with each other what direction should be. So you have a bunch of people who think philosophy is the way to go, and they cannot agree which, which type of philosophy they should use. Uh, a lot of people that believe that science is the way to go, but then they have they don't really have a way to address the issues of foundationalism. And then you have postmodernists that pull towards a, a relativism option, but that's not really a good option either. So instead, what we can do is to have these multiple metaphysical models all interacting within the world of science and developing their own perspectives. And it could just be that we might have to do this for the, for the rest of human existence because we might never be able to fully dismiss these models like we we can we'll never be able to prove it right or wrong or maybe some of them will fall by the wayside because for whatever reason they keep making predictions the predictions fail and people will say well i'm not going to keep working with this paradigm if it keeps you know keeps uh, not not really producing good results whatever happens um we could see that over time but it's possible that these metaphysical models can might coexist for a while for centuries or, or thousands of years and all we're really doing here is that we're saying that humanity has certain epistemic limitations. We we don't have the capacity to, to resolve these issues. So rather than give just give ourselves over to the, the pluralist relativist thing and just abandon knowledge and say, we, we don't really know anything. There's no point in trying. We might as well give up. That's not really an option for us. Or to try to... to build confidence on, on, on these pathways that for whatever reason, even though we tried them before, they don't we can never be sure that they're correct. We could just acknowledge our limitations and say, yeah, well, there's several possible models and we're gonna try them all and work with them simultaneously using Lakatos's competing research programs paradigm uh, and Nancy Murphy's and others that have been moving in that direction. So I propose that this is the way forward uh, and a way to to resolve the challenges that we've had in science and philosophy and religion and epistemology in general, um, and 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 a way forward that actually will lead to cooperation rather than competition. Because all these models can now that they have been acknowledged as legitimate models, they can stop competing and arguing, and they can actually even help each other. Like somebody might do some research. And, Somebody with this model might do some research and say, hey, this, this thing that I've discovered here is actually more helpful to this guy's model. And they might they might help each other out um, and work together in a sense, even though they're doing competing research programs, the scientists themselves uh, don't have to compete with each other and they don't have to be constantly arguing with each other about who's got the correct perspective. We could just allow for multiple perspectives to coexist. So I know that was super complicated. I know that was a lot but hopefully it made sense. And hopefully this can provide a way forward uh, in an area that has been uh, um, really confusing um, for a, a large segment of human history.